All right. Java chapter one. <clears throat> okay. Everyone where we're at, we're in page one, chapter one, book one, edition one. All right. We're going to talk about all this stuff. We're going to talk about hardware. We're going to talk about memory. We're going to talk about drives, algorithms. We're going to just talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Portability, why Java is so nice, a little bit of history behind it, just all kinds of fun stuff. Please ask if you have any questions. Okay. Everybody know what a computer is? What's this thing over here on the left? Says keyboard. Oh, it's, an, it's an input device. It's a keyboard. Okay, we got a mouse, scanners. What? <laughs> Stuff you put crumbs in? Yeah. Uh, any other type of input devices you can think about? There's a big one that's not on there. Microphone. Okay, microphone too. How about the screen? Aren't most things touch screen now? At least yeah. cell phones. A lot of cash registers and Restaurants touch are all touchscreen now. Why did they do that? Why did they switch them to touchscreen? Less, uh, less space that they have to. That they less space, the exactly. Mouse. And now they can just click on the picture of the hamburger or the picture of the whatever. And whenever go to uh, what's that one over here? Uh, new one next to Santa Fe, Jack in the Box. It's got that machine where you can. It's all touchscreen. I want this, that, and eight thousand calorie burger and all that stuff. Sourdough so. Jack. Actually, they're going to hire people without being able to read. That's, that's a good point, too. <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of input devices, okay? They come in, and we have this called CPU, which stands for? Central Processing. Process. Central Processing. It's the brain, basically, and memory. That's where we store stuff, okay? Then output goes to the monitor, the printer, you know, whatever, okay? All right, and then we have the stuff at the bottom, storage devices. We have a hard disk. Uh, we actually have one down in my office. If you've never seen one open, we have one down there that uh, Roy took the top off when we were running it. We started scratching it with pens and spitting on it, and I was polishing it up with the New Testament's Bible and everything, and it finally died. So the Bible did not save the hard drive, but kind of cool. They got spinning platters in there. Okay. Then we have diskettes. Anyone use a floppy disk anymore? No, you can't even get them. <laughs> you can't anymore. Find them. Uh, way back when. Um, it was funny, I found a great way to get unlimited free floppy disks. I used to be an ISP, okay? No, no, no. Call AOL, back when AOL was popular, and say, hey, I'm an ISP. I want to start handing out your disks. They'll send you cases of them. Oh, then you peel the labels off, and there you go. You got a whole bunch of blank floppy disks. <laughs> Worked like a champ. Okay, compact disks. Now we have DVDs and CDs. We have USBs, USBs, okay. What's the biggest USB you all seen? I know there's, I know there's 64. 258 gig? We looked it up in our hardware class last week. 258 gig, wow. Isn't that amazing? That's just, that's crazy. Okay, so this is secondary auxiliary storage, okay. All right, I.O. could be, again, keyboard, mouse, scanner. Output could be monitors, a screen, printer. Okay, CPU, the brain, the central processing unit, or the microprocessor. Okay, we have Core 2 Duo. We have all kinds. Of, we have AMD, there's Intel. There's all kinds of them out there now. Okay, a bunch of different processor types out there. And that's the stuff that's changing all the time. It used to be, remember when we had like the Pentium 66 and the Pentium 33? But now it's like there's so many different names. It's like, what the heck? I don't even know what they are anymore, so. All right, main memory, that's where it does all its calculations. That's kind of like the stuff in your head, your brain, okay? It's often needed to save intermediate results. In other words, it does some sort of calculation, where does it save it? If you ever work with, anyone ever work with assembly language? It's, uh, that's where it's real in depth. I mean, you gotta tell it exactly where to save it to the registers. It's a lot, a lot tougher, okay? So it saves the results in main memory, okay? That way it can get it back again, okay? Memory, memory is also called RAM or random access memory. What happens when you turn the power off? You lose it. You lose it. Okay. It's what happens when you write something to your hard drive and turn the power off? You still got it. You still have it. Now, I have a solid state hard drive at home. What's that mean? Anyone know? It means you can throw it around. It means you spend a lot of money on it. <laughs> no moving parts. No moving parts. I basically have a hard drive, which is like a big flash drive. No moving parts. No moving parts. Okay, what's nice, I can turn on my laptop, and it's totally silent. The only time it ever makes noise is when it gets hot and the fan turns on. So, uh, yeah, I paid way too much for it. I you was going to say, me? do you mind if I ask yeah. how much you paid for it? 
maybe like two years ago, maybe eighteen months ago. Yeah, I paid like two what, two grand. I don't know. Two grand. <laughs> yeah. But the pro, you know, what's even worse than that? I'm actually using it as a stand for my Mac right now. I got a <laughs> Dell XPS Studio. I mean, Studio XPS, the top of the line laptop you could buy about eighteen months ago. I just have my Mac sitting on top of it, so <laughs> it's terrible. I just don't use it much anymore. I just all right. So it says memory contains storage boxes. I don't you love this stuff. Okay, each storage storage box contains pieces of information. Okay, it could store EMU in one. It could E in one place, U in another. Okay, it's basically think of it like Excel, storing a bunch of stuff in there. Okay. All right. So it says each of the six boxes used to store EMU is a byte. So over here on the on the right we have. Memory contents with EM in one, an M in another, and a U in another. Okay. We store it as ones and zeros, though. Okay? So really, we don't store an E. We don't store a one. We store just the binary values. So an E is actually eight zeros, and then zero one, zero, 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 one, zero, one. <clears throat> That's what's actually stored. You ever watch The Matrix? Kind of the same thing. To actually store the binary data, okay? And they're called a bit. Each of the zeros and ones are called a bit. Eight bits make a byte, then you have words, and you go on from there, okay? It says each of the eight bits is called a byte. Okay, the size of your memory is the number of bytes. So 16 megabytes is 16 million bytes. Some odd gigabytes is so many gigabytes, so on and so forth, or terabytes. What's the biggest terabyte drive? I've seen three terabytes. Anything bigger? It's about the biggest right now? I have a couple one terabyte drives. I just get anything bigger than that. So. Bad thing is they're full. No one ever had that same problem? You fill up a terabyte drive, and you're like, how? I, I remember when I bought one of my first computers, I had a 20 megabyte hard drive. Talk it MB. <laughs> now I got a terabyte drive, and it's full of junk. Actually, my, I did when I was in the desert. My drive downstairs where I store all the old school work on it and I put all the podcasts and make all the videos, that is like, you know, nine gigs free right now. So this semester we'll be running out of space. Did all right. Up with movies or something? No, uh, it's like the video for this. Okay, I'm, gonna rec I'm recording this video right now. It's going to be about 700 meg. Easy. Then I'm going to render it into an MP4, which is going to be another couple hundred meg. Well, probably less than that. Probably about 70 meg. But, you know, think about it. If I do that for every lecture in every class every semester, they add up very quickly. Plus, yeah, they have I mean, ISOs of operating systems and stuff. Or if you have yeah, one that's higher than, you know. The, right, different yeah. resolutions. I actually, some of these I had to make them differently so they because on WordPress I'm limited to 100 megs. So I had something like 105 megs. I'm like, oh, man, I had to shorten them a little bit. All right. So. So it says RAM ranges from 512 meg to 3 gigs of RAM nowadays. No. Nowadays is a lot more. Now it's 2 to like 8. Yeah. Uh, XP 32 bit. Because I got 8 gigs. 3 is all you can use anyway. But yeah, 8 gigs of RAM, I'd say, is getting to be quite popular. Why do we want more RAM? Gaming, faster processing, okay. faster data. Makes it work faster. Think about it. You know, if you had to remember some phone numbers, you can only remember yeah. one phone number. How efficient would you be at calling people? Not very. Not very. You'd be looking up every number. But what if you could remember a thousand phone numbers? Be pretty good. Be pretty. That's what memory is. The more the more memory, the more your machine can remember, pretty much. Okay. It's also called volatile. Sometimes I turn the power off. It's gone. RAM does go away. Okay. All right, auxiliary memory is for saving data permanently. It is non-volatile. Now, don't understand that wrong. Does it really save it permanently? I mean, if I write something to a USB drive, let's say a floppy drive, five years from now, am I going to be able to read that? Mm, yes. Depends yeah. on how you store it. Depends, Depends on how you store it. Yeah. Floppy disk, I don't think I have a single usable floppy drive right now. Floppy disk. They're magnetic. What happens to them after time? They break down. CD-ROMs. You know, we all got this DVD, CDR, whatever. We write to them. You know, they're only good for 100 reads. That's what they're normally rated at. And, you know, uh, I had a guy up in Tulsa who was actually doing some research in, as a project. Think about it. You're, you got, you make an image drive for a crime. 
image into a DVD. Ten years from now, they're going to read that DVD. Guess what happens? Yeah, it could be gone. I mean, imagine if there was any electromagnetic interference. We have to drive to start losing some of those magnetics. There's some big issues. So, so somebody could actually get away with a crime because over time your evidence. Is gonna yeah, just stay in jail ten or twenty years. It might be good. You might get out. But if you're serving a life sentence, it's gonna. There you go. Say every ten years, can you go re-verify that evidence for me? But they might catch on. They might copy it to another machine or something. So, all right. So, auxiliary comes in many forms, hard disks, disettes, diskettes, shoot, compact disks, flash drives, all kinds of different ways to store stuff nowadays. They have flash drives in the shape of animals, Hershey's Kisses, all kinds of stuff now. It's like crazy. And they're everywhere. There's probably some sitting up here. We're finding them all over the place. Let's see if there's any of this. Oh, yeah? Not Hershey's Kisses, USB drives. Students leave them all over the place. It was so funny. I had a flash drive the other day in forensics class last semester. And I was like, they wouldn't lose the flash drive? No, no, no one lost it. No one lost it all. So I started using it, as a cl using it to just write junk to from my class. I finally opened up this one document in one day. It was a student sitting in the class. I'm like, dude, this is your homework. He goes, oh, yeah, I guess I did lose that drive. I'm like, okay, okay. Wasn't, wasn't the sharpest tack in the box. But it was. The problem with those USB drives is they do get left everywhere. Well, they're small, so. Yeah, and yeah. Well, they're also portable, and you can get information off of uh, government. Anyone uh, have a TV that reads USB drives? A what? I got three TVs or two TVs that read USB drives. Yeah, I do. Love it. My TV actually broke down, and I called Mitsubishi, and they had me plug my flash drive into my computer and download a file. As soon as I plugged it into my TV, my TV booted back up. Man, I use it all the whole time. I, I, you know, I take DVDs, convert them to M4Vs. Put them on my flash drive, plug it into my TV, watch them all day long. It's awesome. So, very, very handy. So, all right. So, got different storage devices. They say hard disk, 80 gigs. I don't even know if you could find an 80 gig hard drive now. Isn't it the smallest, like 200 something gig now? Okay, solid state. But how about regular, though? They're probably 200. You get an 80 gig PlayStation. Man, okay. So, 80 gig to terabyte. Now we're up to, I know, I've seen at least three terabytes. I haven't seen anything larger than three terabyte. That is, that's a lot of stuff. The problem with drives that big, I mean, if you have an 80 gig drive and it fails, it lost 80 gigs worth of stuff. If you have a three terabyte drive and it fails, wow. you lost a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. Man, I, my son had so much music. Okay, diskettes, 3.5. Don't remember the five and a quarters? 720K? Yeah. Don't really use them much anymore, okay? CDs, we have CD-ROM, CD-RWs, so on and so forth. They handle around 700 meg. DVDs, six or 4.7 to 8.5. Then you know, we also have the Blu-ray now. There's a lot of other stuff out there, okay? The Blu-ray, like 22 to 50 they're, they're a bunch. They're a bunch. Okay, USBs, 128 megs to 64 gigs. But you said, how, you said 258 gigs? Yeah. Wow. Soon that's the way everything, everything's going to be. Uh, I was actually reading an article somewhere in Europe. You know what Redbox is? Y'all know what Redbox is. Yeah. Well, they have a deal where you could rent via USB drives. Think about it. You walk up to Redbox, you plug in the USB drive, it copies the movie to it, and they don't plug it into your TV. A day later, the file won't read. And a day later, the phone will file won't read. Then you don't have to worry about returning it or nothing. Isn't that an awesome idea? Yeah, yeah. then they get don't get any late fees. Well, yeah, but they can also now rent that one movie out to 100 people. They don't have the Same issue of, time. you know, yeah. how many copies they have to have. And I would like it more. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll be yeah, having it here soon. How long does it take for it to copy that movie over? Because I know I got one flash drive. You try to copy just a TV show. Oh, yeah. It takes like five Well, minutes. yeah. I got um, mine at home. I have one flash drive that takes a week. I mean, you start it, come back next month, it's still going. But then there are other ones that are like seconds. So yeah. I, I'm assuming there's probably going to be a stain. You have to have a certain type. Even if you had to buy one from them. Now, spend a dollar. Heck, how much are they saving on the media loan? 
Does anyone ever uh, rent from uh, like Netflix or Blockbusters? You know, when they send it to your house, did you ever ruin a disc? I have. Once. And they don't charge you for it. No. Well, I sent depends. him. I sent it back one day, and the next morning I came out and the wrapper was on the street on the street corner. Someone had gone through my mailbox at night, ripped it apart, took the movie, and left. I called them up. And I'm like, I, I put it in my mailbox last night. It's gone this morning. I said, don't worry about it. We'll mark it down as returned. I said, yeah, as long as you don't make a habit of it, we don't care. What movie was it? Dude, it was years ago. I don't Gone know. Wind. <laughs> Gone with the wind, exactly. The apple dumpling game. But the point is, you know, they had to pay for that, obviously. They have to pay postage and everything else. And, you know, I have Netflix streaming now. The reason I got it is I, you know, I have Cox. I'm assuming some of us have Cox TV around yeah. here. But you know, I was paying for that advanced pack and all that stuff. Really, the only thing we ever watched on was some Disney shows for the kids. So Netflix has all the Disney shows. So I got rid of the advance pack, saved myself $34.99 a month. Now I'm paying 7 bucks for Netflix. I'm like, so I got a very basic cable for the you know, 4 5 9 the regular. And I got everything else on Netflix. Works fine. So. But you can't get you know, any new movies on Netflix. on Netflix. Dude, I work for a yeah, video store. I get all free movies. Well... Well, not yeah. everyone. No, so I take care of computers at a video store, so every week I get every movie out. So. You know, Xbox is coming out with their own cable Netflix. service. I, I can't and they're mind. finally getting Blu-ray. Xbox is finally getting Blu-ray? On their next system, it's going to have Blu-ray, which means for every system they sell, Sony's going to get like 5%. Nice. Well, Sony's nice. About the, their, their stock market's about to skyrocket. Wow. All right, let's continue. All right, drives. This is drive is, enable, is a mechanism that enables the computer to access read or write. A disk drive is a disk from a hard disk, diskette, or CD-ROM. Okay? All right? When using a computer, you sometimes need to copy data from one to another. Is there any other copy data? It's like you drag it and say copy here, move here, whatever. Yeah, they do that. Let me, let me show you. I know, I know this is very basic for some of you. Say you got this uh, hello file. What happens if I drag this file and let go right there? I get an option to move or copy. I say copy, it'll actually make hello, can do we, hello, copy. I can, I don't need that one, I can delete it. But you can just drag and drop stuff. I'll show you a couple other ways you can do that later when you get into the text pad. But. All right, diskettes are normally referred to as your A and your B drive. That was your floppy disk. That's the square ones, you know, the three and a half for the five and a quarter inch disk. Those are normally A and B. These computers here do not, do they have one? Nope, they don't have one finally. Anyone got one at their house still? Anyone got a halfway new computer that still has one? A disk drive? Yeah, a floppy disk. Do you actually still use it though? No, I can't find any oh. disk. <laughs> can't find any disk, there you go. Call AOL. Yeah, call AOL. <laughs> if you can get an answer to the phone since they're basically out of business. But, all right, so diskettes are the A and B, okay? Hard disks are normally C or D. It's kind of important you know this section and wonder why. <coughs> oh, you wouldn't know because you haven't done the quiz yet. All right. CD-ROMs are normally D or E, and then USB are above that. You know, on Windows, you can actually change the drive layer. Yep. Yeah, I do all the time. I make certain ones Z, you know, <laughs> certain ones F, that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, um, so remember, diskettes are normally A or B, hard disks are C or D, and CD-ROMs, you know. What happens is your disk gets your first drive, then you have your hard disk. So if you have a C hard drive, then normally you have a D CD-ROM, unless you have multiple hard disks. Okay. All right. Common vocabulary. Disk space is how much space you have. How much? What's the capacity or the size of it? Not necessarily free space, but how much overall space it has on it. Floppy is the disk. Has anyone ever actually seen one? I don't have one to show you anymore. We used to have them around. I could. You could tear them apart. It's literally got a little floppy piece of like film inside of it. Okay. Memory is normally your RAM. Okay. If I was to say the CPU, what's the CPU? The brains. That's the brain. That, is it that whole box sitting on the floor? No. no. It's a little teeny chip on the inside. But so many people refer to this as a CPU for the computer. Well, it's really the computer. It's not really the CPU. So the computer is the big box containing the CPU and everything else. Okay. All right, let's talk about algorithms and pseudocode. 
So a program is a set of instructions that can be used to solve a problem. Okay. Excuse me, I've got to come up with a little plan. Um, back when I used to run my uh, computer business, a customer of mine was installing or building a new building. And they needed me to come in and do the wiring for them. I had to install network jacks and telephone jacks and all that stuff. So what do you think we worked off of? A blueprint. A, a blueprint. They had a plan of what to do. I didn't just show up to their building and just start running wires wherever I felt like it. So we had a plan. We had something laid out of exactly how the wire is going to be done in this building. Okay. Same with the writing program. This is the first step is writing a draft of your program. You can focus on the basic logic. No specific details. Now, hello world. Okay, there's really is no nothing there. But if you're writing a complex program, yeah, I wrote a prior to D2L, we had WebCT. Prior to WebCT, Rose did not have an online system. But I did. I wrote one years ago all by myself. I wrote one. It was all web-based. Students could take online quizzes, could check their grades. Used it for years. I wrote it without this really first step. <laughs> I just wrote it. And six months later, I'm like, God, what an idiot. I didn't write it correctly, so I had to rewrite it. Well, then the third time I rewrote it, I actually sat down and thought about it. Okay, Because planning out what you're going to do is kind of important. Can you imagine building a house without a blueprint? That would kind of really suck. <laughs> yeah, me and my uh, stepdad have done that. Well, we didn't build the house, but we added on like three extra rooms. Yeah. But we didn't draw out the plans. It kind of took us like a month and a half. Oh, we should have to tear walls down and rebuild them. It, it's tough. It, if, unless you think about it, then oh, it's just tough. All right, so it says um, basic logic, no specific details. It should include instructions that are coherent and logical steps. No need to worry about all the minor stuff at this point. It's normally called an algorithm or the, the plan behind it. Okay? A cake, cake recipe is an algorithm. Uh, I used to always give an example of shampoo. I assume we wash our hair once in a while in here. I'm, maybe not you. <laughs> but the rest of us all wash our hair once in a while. Um, old shampoo bottles. I have checked these have chains. It used to say rinse, or rinse, lather, repeat. It still does. No, it actually tells you rinse, lather, repeat until clean or some stupid thing now. But it used to be just rinse, lather, repeat, and which means you can never finish washing your hair. When did you stop? <laughs> it basically, you know, basically repeat. I mean, it's like going on forever. So, all right. Those so the bottles you can buy at like Dollar, Dollar General or something. Yeah, they, they might still do that. But I actually went home and looked, and they've changed it. So they're written what's called pseudocode. Okay, pseudocode is similar to programming language, except the precise syntax or the Java code's missing. It's written in English. Okay, so here's an algorithm that finds the average miles per hour for a car trip. Okay, okay. So the sample input could be starting location is 100, starting time is 2, any location is 200, any time is 4. Uh, actually, we got How would we? Any idea how we could figure that out? How could we calculate the average time of a trip? Take the distance divided by time. Okay, take distance divided by time. So we would have to take the ending distance, subtract the starting distance. Yeah. Then take the ending time, subtract it by starting time. So now we know how far we went, how long it took, and divide it out. Okay, easy enough to do? That was in English. Did we sit down there and say, int this, string that, that, divide it? No. So a pseudocode, or an algorithm is normally written in pseudocode because it's in English. It should be written in a language that everybody can understand. Then you can take that and convert it to any other language. Okay? You should be able to take that pseudocode, convert it to Java, C. I was in an iPhone programming class this week and should be able to convert it to that. So, all right. All right. Let's talk about the code. This program language is a language that uses specifically designed words, grammar, and punctuation that a computer understands. Someone went into the computer and said, hey, when you see this word, do this specific thing. That's what it is, okay? Visual Basics, C++, Java, there's lots of them out there. There's Fortran, COBOL, SQL, um, Assembly Language. I was doing some work in Assembly Language last couple months. So it's just crazy. And Objective-C, that's the, the uh, iPhone language. So, or what, what do you write for Android? Anybody know? Java. You write Java, yeah. 
Yeah, you can write Java for Android. Okay. For example, it says write a Java code that finds the average miles per hour. Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, then it says initially, programming languages might be hard for you to understand than pseudocode. Okay. Pseudocode is usually easy. Okay. But after your experience with it, it'll get easier. You skip the algorithm. Like when we wrote Hello World, did I sit here and in English design the program and then write it? No, we just wrote it. Okay. So get, get to the point where there's some really basic things you're just going to do. If you're going to add 2 plus 2, do I really need to say, okay, take the number 2 and add the number 2? No, I'm just going to say 2 plus 2. Okay. So that's the way it happens. You know, certain as you get more advanced in it, but, you know, for the majority of the programs here, you're going to be able to just write the program. But in the real world, if you write complex programs without thinking about it first, you can be like me, rewriting the database program three times. Okay? All right. Uh, however, the larger program is recommended you do not skip the algorithm because if you, it's like the blueprint. It, if you just build a house without designing it first, you're going to have some serious problems. Big problems. Right, actually, you know, going back to that thing was kind of funny because I had a house built. And when they did the blueprints, it was weird. My neighborhood, I live right off I-40 and Choctaw Road, my neighborhood had two builders in it that were related to each other. I had the cheap builder, half the houses had the good builder. Well, my cheap builder, when he got all done, was like, oh, man, they didn't figure out a place to have a well. They didn't put in a place for the water pressure tank. So they stuck it in the attic. What do you think happened the first winter? <laughs> Bro, solid. Started leak. I had no water, then started dripping down into my ceiling. I'm like, that was called not very good design. Because he says, we're going to stick it inside the pantry. Then the, the inspector was like, oh, no, you're not. You can't have those things inside the house. It has to be outside the living quarters. So he put so it in the attic. Richardson, what, what's what's the, the VA attic, of course. <sighs> No, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like turn a one month job into a three month job. Yeah, uh, so it was scary. But, all right. So, how does it work? It says this is for non Java programs, okay? So, after writing a program, you normally have the computer program task specified, get it to work, you know how it does. First way, you compile it and then you run it. We actually did that with TextPad. Remember, we compiled it and then we ran it, okay? When you compile, really what you're doing is telling the computer to translate it from the language you wrote it in until the ones and zeros, until the executable code. Okay? Let's say we can't see a piece of executable code. Uh, let's see if I can't find one. Let's look at our C drive here. We'll find something, hopefully. Maybe not. There'll be, there'll be something here. Well, here, reader. Here's Adobe Reader. Okay, I'm going to open up Adobe Reader. I'm going to open up a text pad. Look what I get. Get a bunch of gobbledygook I can't understand. Okay? So basically, it's machine language. Okay, if I had a hex editor installed, I could actually show you what it really looks like. We just don't have a hex editor on these machines. So, so I can't show you that. All right. So basically, it compiles it into the binary format of ones and zeros. And when you run it, it just runs those. Okay? There's some problems with it. Okay? It says the compiler... Contains a special, you know, you use the compiler to convert it. It says it translates it into binary form, which is the source code of the compiler, then basically comes, becomes object code and then makes the actual formatting. There's a problem with it. Anyone know what the problem is with these with compilers with other than Java, like with C or Visual Basic or C Sharp? Anyone know what the problems are? Well, what happens if I compile something on this machine in C? It's only good for that type of machine. It's only good for this type of machine. It's not going to run on an Apple. It's not going to run on your car. It's not going to run on your cell phone or your refrigerator. It's only going to run on this type of machine. Java, on the other hand, will run on anything. Okay? That's what makes Java so good. Exactly. So, again, we're, we're talking non-Java programs here. We have our source code. We write this. Okay? Then we have our object code, and we basically link them together. Okay? We compile it into object code. Then we run the object code, which is the actual instructions. Okay. But again, it's made for the specific system it was written on. Okay. It's a set of binary instructions. I guess that's the ones and zeros. That's because that's what computers understand, obviously. Okay. 
Could be a 16-bit instruction. This is 16-bit because there's 16 ones and zeros. Okay, it could be 32 or 64-bit now. And we've got a 64-bit OS. Some of us probably have one at home, a couple of you. Right here. Because you got more memory, stuff like that. Yeah. These on these this table should be 64-bit. Okay. It says, each object instruction here is in charge of only a simple thing. It does certain things. And, you know, they, like in Hello World, we told it to output Hello World. Well, these instructions tell the computer to do different things. Okay. But sometimes these instructions are called machine code, which is not quite ones and zeros, but it's close. Okay. Which is like assembly language. Right. Not very portable. It says pizza software is portable if it can be used on many different types of computers. Okay, we talked about if we compile it with C on this machine, it's only gonna work on this machine. Now, I grade, I say 50 to 75% of my homework on a Macintosh at home. If we were writing in C or Visual Basic, could I be doing that? Not without Fusion or something else, because I can't run Visual Studio on a Mac, but I can grade Java all day long. Okay? It says object code is not very portable. As you know, object code is comprised of binary instructions, and they're set up to a particular type of computer. Okay? It's only going to run on the kind it was made. Okay? So Java, we solve that. We have something called byte code. So Java compilers don't compile all the way. They compile to an intermediate code called bytecode. Okay? This is possesses both the features of the object code and source code. Tells it what to do, but it's not totally compiled. Then we have what's called a Java runtime edition, which then runs it. Okay. Okay? Here's our Java virtual machine. So how can we run this? Well, basically, you just got to get a Java virtual machine that runs, or a JVM, for your specific machine. So Oracle, who owns it now, just needs to write a JVM for your whatever device. And it will look for an object code and just run it. So it looks for that bytecode that we make. And let's look and see what bytecode looks like. I know I showed you this the other day, but we're going to look at it again. Go to my Java class here. Okay, this here's my Dewey Ken Hello program I wrote. Let's look at that. What that looks like. English. We all can read that. Okay, everybody see that? No. That's source code. Then I compiled it into this class file. This is the intermediate or the byte code, and that's what it looks like. Can we read that? We can read some of it. We can see the basic instructions. Okay, you can see it's going to be using Java Lang string. Obviously, I output a string, so we're using that. We got a name of the source file, and we know the file is called DeweyKenHello.java. Okay, we're going to be using the IO print stream, well, because I'm using print line, so we can actually read some of that. So it's not strictly ones and zeros yet, but it's kind of like it's kind of like um, you ever go to the grocery store and you buy the banquet chicken or the stuff that's fully cooked already. What do you do? You take it home, heat it up in the oven for 40 minutes, you're finishing up. It's not quite finished, but pretty darn close. That's what this is. It's not quite finished, but it's close that I can take it. Can you imagine if you bought that chicken and only worked in this one specific oven? <laughs> that would suck. There was a banquet chicken for the gas oven, banquet chicken for the electric oven, banquet chicken for the whatever oven. That would suck. So what you have is you have the chicken that's not quite finished, and so you take it home, stick it in your oven, and finish same with this here. You got a program that's going to work on anything. Then all you need is the Java virtual machine to run it. Okay? So you can see it took this here, converted it to here. Okay? And the hex editor would look different. Okay, so we use the JVM. Okay. It's going to show how it translates. So we take our source code into bytecode. So the compiler compiles it into this intermediate value of bytecode. Okay? So when it, the Java program runs, the Java virtual machine transfer or basically translates it into object code and actually executes it. So it makes it work on the Macintosh or the PC or the whatever you're running it on. The cell phone, your car, whatever. Okay. History of it. Since 1990s, they were expecting home appliances to be everywhere. Best Buy, man, a few, man, probably 10 years ago now. They used to have an advertisement for when was the last time your refrigerator helped you with your homework? What it was was a refrigerator with a tablet PC built in the front of it. 
And you could do homework on it, you could play games on it, whatever. On your refrigerator? On your refrigerator, yes. Yep. Sorry. Yep, they, they had one. Um, point is, it never really got there. Mm -hmm. But do we have intelligent devices now? What do you think? Well, yeah. We have lots of them. Let me show you one here real quick. Someone actually thought of a refrigerator. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Mm -hmm. See if I can remember the login. No guarantees it's going to work. Ah, come on. Yes. Man. All right. So I'm sitting here at Rose State talking to you guys, and there's the temperature of my house. There's my thermostat at my house. It is currently 6 to 8 in my master bedroom, 6 to 9 in the living room. The heater's off at the moment. But I could really freak them out. I could sit here and turn the heat up, put the heat down. I could do whatever I wanted with it. Okay. Actually, wait, let me show you. So if I bring this up to, we'll say, 70. Okay, and then I hit submit down here. Now you'll watch this off here. See where it says off? Oh, it's not quite. There it is. Heat's on now. That's going to cost me power. Hold on, we're going to cool them babies down to about 67. I don't need the heat. I'm not there. Jeez, now the heat's going to go off in a second. Another example. You can actually bring this up from anywhere. Give it a minute. Wait for it. It's a little slow. No, this is no. I have those too. No, I'm not bringing up the cameras. Who knows what's going on in the house right now? No one ever seen these here? This is the total energy detective. It tells you the exact power consumption at my house this very second. 0.149. It was 0.152 a second ago. It just dropped. Now I could. It's actually costing me six cents an hour right now. So it means a couple lights on, a couple different things. Yeah, so now we're down to point one. Oh, I can see my bill. Man, look at that. I used nothing. Wow, must have reset. So, but yeah, kind of cool. Point five one. I tell you what, you turn the toaster on, this sucker jumps. It's like way up there. But these are just internet enabled devices. I mean, I can show you my solar panels. I can get into my car. I can do all kinds of stuff with this stuff. So, but the point is, you know. You know, people thought it was going to be everywhere. So, do you, you ever expect it to get there? I think it will. I know there's refrigerators now where you can actually scan the items as you put them in the refrigerator and scan them and take them out, and they'll tell you when you need to buy certain things. They think about it. Have a barcode on your milk, and it knows that every time you take it out, you drink eight ounces of it. So, every time the milk is in now, it's going down by eight ounces. It can be done. Imagine if we had something like that that would automatically. Message the hardware or the, the milk store to send me some milk. Sky or tell you your expiration dates. Sky yeah, Sky expiration Sky dates. Sky 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 okay. But Sky what about Sky lights? Sky I can turn. You know, I can unlock and lock my doors in my house from here. Is that handy? Yeah, it was actually. I used it this morning. I locked the house and went out the car. I'm like, did I lock the back door? I brought up my cell phone. I looked. This is up. Oh, no back doors unlocked. Ran in and locked real quick. So. So, but you know, there's a lot of stuff to do. And how do a lot of these things run? Java. Very low overhead. Basically, they just make custom chips that do only specific things. Okay? I don't run into Okay, we got it. All right. So, televisions can be controlled. I have sling box. Anyone have a sling box? I don't know about it. <sighs> sling box. I can watch my TV from anywhere. I watch it from my, my computer room. Because I'm too lazy to go in there and turn it on. But yeah, it, what it is is a little device sits on top of my TV, and I watch. It connects to the internet, and I can watch TV off my phone, off my computer. I can watch it from my office. I can watch it from anywhere. So, it's kind of like Netflix kind of thing. All right. Can you they, change channels? Oh, I can change channels. I can pause it. I can do everything. 
So you're on your TV, but you're, at, say, at the office. Yeah. You can watch your yes. DVR and stuff. Or? Sure. Watch a lot of military people buy the... And see, I also have something called Schlage Link, which I can oh. turn things on and off. So I actually, like, right now my ceiling box is turned off. But I can remotely turn it on, and then I can get in remotely and watch TV. What's that show you like? You can watch your... You can watch anything on it. You can watch anything. All right. But Sun, who originally started this, said, wow, this is going to happen. Breaking Bad. Originally, yeah, Breaking Bad. That's a good... Anyone ever seen Breaking Bad? It's kind of addictive, isn't it? I couldn't stop. I watched all See, the way through it. Breaking Bad is about meth. <laughs> meth is so addictive that if you even watch meth, you get addicted. I mean, they said meth is very... Yeah, even the viewing it, you get addicted. So it's... The other day, where they... Meth, meth. The two guys were trying to make him... Work for him, yeah. give, him the, give him his recipe, yeah. and he knocked the powder in there. And I oh, that was the first episode. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty season. good. That's pretty good. So, all right. Good, good show if you ever want to watch it. All right. Uh, basically, they want to come up with something for intelligent home appliances. <clears throat> I see us getting there. It's just that it's I don't not think there right really now. There's desire for like, all of that. They thought it was, like, it was possible, but I don't think people really want to do crap on the refrigerator. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm here's saying. let me tell you, okay? I bought a car back in late 90s. So how many people had a GPS in the car in the late 90s? I did. Anyone have a GPS in the car now? A couple of you do? You like them? I love them. I went over here to Hudeberg to buy me an SUV with a GPS in it. I says, where's your SUV's GPS? Like, why would anyone want a GPS in their car? I'm like, you're idiots. Everybody wants a GPS in their car. But now there's more and more cars with GPSs. What's going to happen? We just don't know about this yet. What if you could literally, you know, set your phone to turn your coffee pot on at 3 in the morning? Uh, back when I ran an ISP, I had obviously a lot of servers in there. It got hot. I had an internet-enabled thermostat. If the temperature ever got too hot, it would send me a message. I was out working in my yard one day. I would you know, put air in my tractor tire, and I was working on there. My phone goes off. It's my server room messaging me that it's too hot in here. What I'd done was I'd turn on the air compressor and i flipped the circuit breaker for the air conditioner system. So without that, my servers would have all died. So there's just so much more you can do like that. You know, checking the milk in the fridge, maybe not so much. But how about turning lights on and off, opening your shades? Mm -hmm. Bill Richards, uh, he teaches Unix for us every now and then. He has a system using uh, X10. His system goes out and checks daylight savings. He checks the whatever sunrise and sunset every day. He said it automatically turns the lights on when needed. Automatically turns them off when needed. Automatically does everything. So it's kind of cool. All right. Well, there so, are a lot of smart or houses that are you know, built in smart right. homes and everything. So they're they're getting and they're all Java enabled. Not all of them, but majority of them are. They so it's pretty simple. Are like that. You buy a car alarm. Give you like this little video screen you put on your keychain. If yeah. somebody breaks into your car, it goes off and it lets you know how they got in, whether they broke a window or nice. they jimmied your doors. Yeah. Or... Well, I went into the commissary yesterday on Tinker, and uh, oh, bad idea. and actually it was empty, believe it or not. I went in there and I got my. Oh man, did I lock the car? I said, Oh, it doesn't matter. I you know clicked on my phone, clicked on OnStar, I clicked a little button here and said, Oh, lock car. Sent your request and said car's locked. So, you know, it's that easy nowadays. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to do with this, okay? So it says uh, they became, they could embed this stuff into the processor chips, okay? Pretty cheap because Java code's very, very low overhead. If you can make a chip that does just one thing, there was a TV a movie, 21. You ever seen 21? Yep. Remember they were building that robot? Yeah, they were building the robot, and they, they didn't get the right size chip. I mean, if you could buy a chip that's so small to run Java, that's all it's going to do. That's all you really need, okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Be nice. All right, but to do all this, they must be quite portable, obviously, so that's where Java could come in. My Blu-ray player at home, Sony Blu-ray player, is all Java-based. Anyone else have anything Java-based at their house? They got you. You probably don't even realize it. If you have anything but... An iPhone, you got Java on your phone. So I'm sure you do. All right. It says, originally they planned for C++ for home appliances, but they said, you know what, that's not very portable. It's not powerful enough. It's not as secure either. Okay? Did I, did I, did I go back one? 
Okay. Yeah, it's not very portable, okay? Okay, it says it relies heavily on pointers, which we haven't got to yet, but we will talk about that. So it says, rather than fixing it, they come up with Java. It says the new language originally named Oak for the tree that was outside their window and soon changed to Java, probably because they're drinking coffee. I don't know. Okay. When it dried up, it came up for everything else. Java, everybody started to use it. They said, you know, we got this language. We were going to use it. We're not anymore. So now they made it open source. So now it's everywhere. Okay. So Java is pretty darn popular. Okay. Web pages are portable. You know, they have JavaScript. They have all kinds of different versions. Okay. Same with the language for web pages, HTML, but also runs JavaScript, stuff like that, which is the most popular. Okay. This is their Java program is very portable and they're portable and they're better than HTML, okay, for interactive capabilities. Okay. HTML5 is different now. Java programs also make what's called applets. Um, there's, you probably have been to websites that use Java. Actually, was it one the other day? I forget which one it was. There's quite a few. Now, HTML5 is changing that up a little bit, but they are still out there. Okay? So, applets are still there, okay? But applets are nice, but they do have some limitations, but it does have a lot of security, which is nice as well. Okay? We're going to be using Java SE or Standard Edition. That's where we're going to be writing, which I already showed you guys where to download it from. Works on desktop, laptop. You don't even need the internet to make it work once you download it. That is. All right. Is that the end of Chapter 1? That's it. Wow. All right. That's the end of Chapter 1.